everybody. I am so happy you chose to join us again on our Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis YouTube page. We are so happy and that you chose to join us again. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace that you have extended to us. Thank you, Father, for your provisions. Thank you for giving us a heart and a mind to study your word. We ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on our article number 13, A Gospel Church. And our author writes, We believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by a covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ governed by his laws and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that it is its only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, deacons, whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistle to Timothy and Titus. And so our scripture, uh, it's coming from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. And if you recall, in previous lessons, I've read the entirety of those scriptures, but today we will read verses 7 through 9 out of the NIV version. That's 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 7 through 9, the NIV version. And it reads, Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. And so as we have stated in previous lessons, the church at Corinth had many issues that Paul needed to address, but he does not start his letter with those issues. Instead, he reminds them of who they are in Christ. He confirms their faith and their calling and lets them know that he always thanked God for them. Can you imagine the difference in our relationships if when addressing a problem, if we began on a positive note instead of coming out ready to chop a person down, ready to let them know that they've messed up and how wrong or no good they are, would you agree that the average person already know that they fall short of the glory of God and they really don't need anyone reminding them of that? I think most of us start in a knockdown state and we really don't need anybody to take us a notch or two down even more we are there already so the church knew that they were acting badly they knew that there that there was a gap between what they had been taught and how they were acting that that was the reason they had written to paul with a list of questions that needed that they needed instructions on and paul by the grace that had been given to him knew that it was not profitable to start the letter by knocking them down even further so he starts the letter by building them up uh letting them know that they were elect people set apart for god's use they were enriched people and established people Verse 5 says, For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. In other words, they had been given everything they needed for life and godliness. And based on that fact, in verse 7 he says, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. They had all the spiritual gifts needed for that current time. They lacked nothing. They experienced the favor of God in every area of their life. They were blessed with all the gifts and the blessings of, of, of God's spirit. The King James Version of verse 7 says, 
that they were enriched by the Spirit of God in all utterance and in all knowledge. Utterance means anything to do with speech. That would include gifts such as prophecy and teachings and tongues, whatever kind of speech needed to praise God and do witness for Christ, they were enriched with it. They were also enriched with the gifts of all knowledge, which is the spiritual gifts of understanding all spiritual truth and doctrine. So they were, uh, they were highly enriched. They, they had it all. It, it, it means that by God's grace, they were given an unusual awareness into the nature of God. They understood the gospel and the role it played in the life of a believer. They were enabled by God's grace to know and understand the truth of God's word, which enabled them to speak the truth to a lost and dying world. But they were acting badly. And so just because they were enriched with all utterance and all knowledge, that does not mean that every individual in the church had all gifts, but that the church as a whole had all gifts. You know, one had this one, this gift, somebody else had that gift, and, and but together they had the gift of all utterance and all knowledge. They lacked nothing spiritually in the way of gifts of the spirit. I really do find that amazing. They had it all. You would expect them to be walking around on a spiritual high, extremely righteous and holy. You would think that they would be so close to God that on a daily basis, uh, somebody like in a, in the Old Testament would be no more. They would walk so close with God that they would just walk up to heaven, that God would just walk them up to heaven, but not so. This is the church with all spiritual utterance and all knowledge. This is the church that Paul had to reprimand about being carnal. I heard it said, and, and I agree, uh, that those who are blessed with the most are at the greatest risk of squandering it all. You ever notice that when you have been to the mountaintop, that is when you are, it's like when you've been to the mountaintop, when you've accomplished, when you have achieved, that's when you are most vulnerable. I read an article about people that climb Mount Everest. Now, mind you, I can't even fathom why a person would even think of doing such a thing, but those that do. There are those that 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 uh, strive to climb Mount Everest. Anyway, according to this article, as treacherous as the climb is, people actually make it to the 29,028 feet summit. They actually climb the mountain. And amazingly, the climbers often they use up all their energy going up the mountain and, and, and not even think about the energy that will be needed to get back down. And this results in them becoming weak and vulnerable to getting sick and even possibly dying. According to a study published in the British uh, Medical Journal in 2006, on average, there has been one death for every 10 successful attempts to climb the mountain. Most people understand the dangers of mountain climbing. However, few consider the not so obvious dangers of coming down. As wonderful as a mountaintop experience may be, the real danger lurks on the other side when coming down. Truth is, we are more vulnerable after a mountaintop experience than we are after a failure or a loss. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 12, 
Paul gives a warning to those in the church that consider themselves to be strong. He says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Now, the context for that verse is he's talking about temptation. The temptation after a mountaintop experience is to think we're invincible. The, the temptation after being gifted with all utterance and all knowledge is to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. You think, I'm all that and a bag of chips. What could be better? What could possibly go wrong? And the reality is that anything and everything could go wrong. Such was the chaos in the church at Corinth. Mountaintop experiences are awesome. We love them. We like to have them. But we must be prepared for the coming down. You know, have you ever gone up a mountain? It's like when you go up a mountain, you are, are, are expending energy going up. And then when you come down, it's like it takes more um, traction to come down because if you're not careful, you know, coming down the mountain, you can tend to go too fast and use more uh, uh, energy, more breath. Your heartbeat may go stronger because it takes a lot to come down. And most times we're just so happy that we made it up that we don't consider the coming down. The, the energy needed in coming down. Paul said we are to covet earnestly the best gifts and to we are to desire spiritual gifts. But remember that possessing the gifts of the spirit does not mean that we are strong in the Lord. Just as it takes preparation to come down from the mountaintop and to become acutely aware of our own vulnerability, so it is when you've been gifted with spiritual gifts. No gifts, no ability, no endowment from God should ever be abused or cause a controversy. In fact, gifts should be built on, should be used to build up the church, not to tear them down. And this is what was happening in the church of Corinth. They had all utterance and all knowledge, and yet the church was in chaos. The gifts were to build up the church. It was not to tear down the church. Well, that's all I have for today. Be sure to join us next time as we continue our study of a gospel church. And until then... Until next time, stay safe, be blessed, and bye-bye.